ice sheets like Greenland and Antarctica are so large, can you outline what potential threat they pose to humanity this century? So the two ice sheets covering Greenland and Antarctica hold 99.5% of all the land ice on the planet. We, you know, it's easy to forget they exist because people don't live it permanently in Antarctica at all and there's only 50,000 in Greenland. But if you got rid of both those ice sheets, you'd raise global sea level by 65 metres. So in old money, that's over 200 feet. You can say, I'm, I mean, nobody's, gonna, nobody's suggesting we're going to get rid of both ice sheets tomorrow, but even a 10% reduction in their volume will be six metres of sea level rise. That's unimaginably catastrophic for humanity. And how does that fit into the emission scenarios that we're, we're kind of talking about here, where we're on track to where we might hope to be? Well, I don't want to get too technical, but our current trajectory, what we're doing right now and what we have been doing for the last you know, few decades, uh, doesn't look very, very encouraging for the ice sheets and for sea level rise. Um, I mean, if, if you take what was agreed in Paris in 2015, the Paris Agreement, uh, that's something called nationally declared contributions. We're looking at something like a three degree warming by 2100. And that could result in a sea level rise of oh, potentially over a metre by the end of the century. Okay. Is there a best case scenario that we might hope for, say, if we say we were to hold to 1 to 1.5? What happens to the ice sheets at that sort of temperature? So if we, if we manage to stick below 1.5, which, you know, is going to be really tough, but if we do, um, there is some sea level rise that's locked into the system. Even if we stopped carbon emissions tomorrow, we are going to see sea level rise continue because there's so much thermal in the, ocean, in the oceans and the ice sheets. But if we stay below 1.5, I think we can, we can limit the worst consequences of sea level rise. And it's all about the rates. It's how fast sea level goes up. Because if the rate is, is low enough, at a minute, it's about four millimeters a year, which doesn't sound like a lot, um, we can adapt. If it's too fast, then, you know, adaptation is not really an option and we're going to see migration on a scale that we can't really imagine. OK, so speed is critical. What about if we, if we stay on a higher trajectory? Let's say we, we're going to 2 or 2.5. Right, OK. If we stay on a higher trajectory, if we, if we go with NDCs or what we're currently doing, which we call business as usual, then things are going to look a lot worse and there's no way that we can adapt in a managed way and that we're going to have any kind of what you might call um, comfortable outcome from sea level rise. It's one of the worst consequences, one of the most serious consequences of climate change. And yeah, the high emission scenarios look really grim. You mentioned in the talk yesterday potential and that you can you can explain this now but of a two meter sea level rise this century how does how would that come about and what would be the the actual outcome of that so two meters of sea level rise would flood on an annual basis based on current population characteristics about 630 million people around the world that's a tenth of the population of the planet um, and that in itself is unimaginable if that happens we're looking at um, the breakdown of civilization as we know it. We're looking at conflict, global conflict. I mean, you know, that's unthinkable. Um, and for two meters of sea level rise to happen, we would need to see some instabilities in both Antarctica and Greenland happening. And the models and our, our, our theory suggest that those, those instabilities do exist. We don't know exactly what temperature threshold they'll really kick in and, and, and what rate those instabilities will produce in terms of sea level rise, but we know they exist and we know that from what's called the paleoclimate record. If we look at past sea level changes over thousands of years, we can see these really, really dramatic increases in sea level in the past record. So we know they're there. Okay. And just really to end on, you've been coming to COPS for nearly 20 years. You know, you know the, the lay of the land and the hype and everything else. When you listen to what we heard yesterday from so many different uh, quarters, does it fill you with hope that this time we're going to do it? What's your outlook? That's a really difficult question. Um, it's difficult because um, 
Uh, that's like an honest answer. Um, and then... We'll go with that. <laughs> my honest answer is I'm not overly optimistic. What drives that kind of... your, your, your sort of reasoning? Um, because I, I've, I've seen the negotiations, I've seen the processes, I've seen the rhetoric before. I've, uh, I, I, don't see, I don't see anything significantly different here. Okay. So, pessimism with the, with the world leaders, and we've got to try and look for something else. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there are, there are glimpses of optimism. I think that the youth movement, the, the mobilisation of um, civil society and their increasing concern and direct action, um, I, I think that, that demonstrates that people are, are concerned and then, you know, if they're concerned, governments become concerned because, you know, governments want to stay in power and they have to do what then, you know, the people think are important. They have to respond to those, those drivers. So we need more action. Okay, well, it's been great to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for the conversation.